Hello and welcome to episode 37 of Radicals in Conversation, the monthly podcast from Pluto Press, one of the world's leading independent radical publishers. For decades we've spoken of the Israel-Palestine conflict, but what if our understanding and framing of the issue has been wrong all along? Well, that's the argument of a new book that's coming out in January 2021, titled Decolonising Israel, Liberating Palestine. I'm Chris Brown, and joining me today is the author of the book, Jeff Halper, who, in addition to his writing, is head of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions and a founding member of the One Democratic State campaign. Now, before we get started, it's time to give a shout out to Pluto's latest crop of Patreon patrons. They are... Anna Maria, Nick Johnson, Biscatoria, Christopher Mead, Grant Ennis, Cuddlepunk, The Boots Are On, Stephen Ward, Issy Scott, Marie Chaplot, and Amber Watt. So, a big thanks to all of the above for your continued support and solidarity. If you want to know more about our Patreon, including all the various member benefits, which include access to the unabridged version of Radicals in Conversation, then head over to patreon.com forward slash Pluto Press. And now back to today's show with our guest, Jeff Halper. OK, welcome everyone to Radicals in Conversation after a slightly longer break than usual. It's great to be back in the studio, as it were, one last time before the end of the year. Uh, and it's my real pleasure today to welcome Jeff Halper to the show. Uh, Jeff is a longtime Pluto author whose published works include An Israeli in Palestine, War Against the People, and now the new book, Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine. And that's still a few weeks away from its official publication date, comes out in January, but it's available to pre-order already on plutobooks.com. Now, many listeners will be aware of Jeff Halper's political work as head of the Israeli Committee Against Housing Demolitions, and more recently as a founding member of the One Democratic State campaign. Uh, So it's really great to have him on the show. So Jeff, welcome. Yeah, how are things with you? How have you been keeping these last few weeks? All right, all right. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, everything's uh, good. Doing all the follow-up work for the book, you know, trying to get the word out. I mean, the book was written, of course, not just as an academic book, but as really a part of our One Democratic State campaign to be used Mm. for information, to be used to get the word out. So um, it's not just like another addition to my CV. It's a, it's a fantastic book from what I've read so far. I mean, anyone should be able to pick it up and, you know, gain insight from it. It's not, yeah, some ivory tower piece. Inshallah. Anyway, with a podcast like ours, I guess, that covers a range of topics, um, we anticipate that folks listening will have, I suppose, a passing familiarity with what we're discussing, but not necessarily an expertise. So I thought maybe we should just lay a bit of the groundwork to start with. Most people will have heard of the two-state solution to the you know, Israel-Palestine conflict, scare quotes. Uh, but perhaps we should start by exploring briefly what that is, what the two-state solution is, um, how and when it emerged as an idea and gained traction, um, and, and kind of on its own terms, what it would look like if it were to be implemented. Well, you know, um, this uh, so-called conflict goes back uh, more than 100 years the beginning of the Zionist movement in the 1890s. The problem is, and this is really how I, how I begin the book, that it's not a conflict. Mm. That's, really, that's really been the problem, because if you give the wrong term to something and you start to misanalyze it, it doesn't lead you to a resolution. A conflict, let me begin this way, a conflict, you know, is between two or more sides. They disagree about something, fight about something. And the way you resolve a conflict is you get the sides together and they negotiate and they compromise and they get to some kind of a peace. Mm. And then you've resolved the conflict. That's the way, in a sense, Israel and Zionism always liked to portray it as a conflict because it created a false symmetry. It's as if there's mm. two legitimate nationalisms that come in conflict over a land that they both legitimately claim And both sides have to compromise, both sides have to negotiate, both sides, both sides. But in fact, Zionism was a settler colonial movement, very similar to the United States, Canada, you guys, the Brits in um, Ireland back in the Mm -hmm. 19th century in many ways, Uh, certainly the French in Algeria, South African case, Australia, New Zealand. I mean, there are a lot of cases in the world of uh, settler colonialism. Now, we all know about colonialism. 
in a general way. We know that the, that the British were the colonists of India. Settler colonialism is different. I mean, the British in India never intended to make India British. Mm. They're never going to annex it. They didn't claim that it belonged to them or that the Indians were going to become Brit British or they're going to extend citizenship or India was going to become another province of, of the UK. Colonialism, classically, was simply when, when a foreign country would take over another country for purposes of extraction, to extract labor, cheap labor, to extract resources, and so on. Settler colonialism, like Zionism and these other cases I mentioned, is different. In this case, a foreign population comes into a country with the idea of taking it over. Hmm. I mean, they're not immigrants. Immigrants, of course, always go to different countries. There's migrations all the time, and the immigrant populations integrate you know, more or less into the new country they come to. The settlers, on the other hand, claim that country as their own. It belongs to them. It doesn't belong to the indigenous people. And every settler movement then invents a narrative about why this country belongs to us and not to the people living there, why we're entitled to it. It often has to do with God, of course, uh, and in the course of the case of Zionists, it has to do with the biblical claim that this was our country and we got thrown out and now we're coming back and it belongs to us. God gave it to us. You can add that to it. And it's unilateral. I think this is the, the, the main point in terms of any kind of political re resolution. Settler colonialism is unilateral. There isn't another side. The Zionists never thought of the Arabs or the Palestinians. That wasn't a part of their equation. They had a story of why they want to go back to that country, why the country belongs to them, their rights to the country. They had a whole process of conquering the country, of settling the country. It had nothing whatsoever to do with Arabs, as we call them. Hmm. Uh, and the, the place of the Palestinians, of the indigenous people, was really, uh, I mean, it was a disposable population. The problem was what to do with them. Do we kill them, which we did, partly, do we expel them, which we did massively? Do we confine them to little areas? Do we force them to emigrate to, to other places? In other words, there's all kinds of strategies of, of what do you do to the natives? But the point is you eliminate the natives from the equation so that the whole thing becomes our story. It's our story. It's our country. It's our privilege. Uh, we run the process. You see, and that's where settler colonialism is very different from a conflict because you can't resolve a settler project through negotiations. Mm -hmm. Palestinians can't be expected to negotiate their rights, national or human rights or civil rights, especially if they've been driven off their land. And at the same time, the colonists don't ask the natives what their opinion is. They don't care. They're not going to, the Palestinians are not going to set back the Israelis or deny the Israelis or the Zionists the country, you see. So the only way, and this is the whole point of the book, the only way then to resolve a settler colonial situation is through decolonization. And we'll come to that in a minute. But just, all right, now having set that stage, going back to your question, so all these years from the 1890s, let's say, until today, actually. I mean, the, the whole through the whole process, from the Zionist, later Israeli point of view, it's been one continual process, a unilateral process of what we call Judaization, to Judaize Palestine, to turn an Arab country into a Jewish country. So there's never been the two-state idea. I mean, Israel might have talked about it a little bit in terms of Oslo, because that's what you know, the United States wanted, but they never, ever, ever intended for a two-state solution. And Israel never, even in Oslo, uh, agreed to a two-state solution or to even recognizing Palestinian national rights. All Israel agreed to in Oslo in the 1990s was uh, to recognize the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, as a negotiating partner. But it did not recognize any of their national rights to any of the country. So that Israel never had a two-state solution in mind. It was always this settler colonial idea of taking the entire country. 
From the Palestinian point of view, it was different. The Palestinians were always anti-colonial. In other words, once they began to figure out in the 1890s that an invasion is, is underway, their country is being invaded by Zionists with the intention of, dis, of disenfranchising them and displacing them, they began to develop an anti-colonial movement. And it took time, as it does with indigenous peoples, because they didn't really have a very well-formed idea of nationalism or a state. They, they didn't really have nation states. They were part of the Ottoman Empire uh, for most of, it, uh, of their modern history. And so it took them a while, but they became anti-colonial. And that, of course, in the 1960s, when the PLO was established under Arafat, it was an anti-colonial organization, and it had very strong ties with the whole anti-colonial world of the 60s. You know, where Africa and many countries in Asia and other parts of the world were freeing themselves from colonial rule. But what happened was the Palestinians started to get more isolated as the other colonial regimes got their independence and kind of moved on. Israel was stayed very strong, partly because it had the support of the United States and Britain and Europe and the international community. And I think just kind of practically gauging their possibilities of, of possibilities of success. By the 1970s, the PLO had moved from an anti-colonial position to beginning to accept the, the two-state idea. And mm -hmm. finally, in 1988, the PLO accepted the two-state solution, which is basically says, all right, the territory that Israel conquered in 1948, which was 78% of historic Palestine, that will be a Jewish state. We give up that land. In other words, the Palestinians gave up 78, you know, claim to 78% of their country. An amazing concession. Uh, no other colonial people ever did that. On condition that the other 22%, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza become a Palestinian state. That's the idea of a two-state solution. It's not a 50-50 split but rather a 78, 22% split in Israel's favor. Mm -hmm. So it's a tremendously pro-Israel compromise, if you want to call it a compromise. Mm -hmm. but the PLO bit that bullet and in 1988 accepted that, and that led then to Oslo. But in fact, as we know, Israel never intended to give up the 22%. They wanted the whole country. Settler colonial regimes they want the whole country. They don't want to, again, give up to the... Uh, anything up to the natives. And so essentially, you know, the Palestinian leadership of the Palestinian Authority has gotten stuck in the two-state solution. They still advocate the two-state solution, even though we know that it's gone, not only because Israel doesn't want it, never wanted it, but in the meantime, Israel has settled close to a million settlers in the occupied territory with massive cities and highway systems and infrastructure and integrated the West Bank and East Jerusalem into the Israeli economy to a point where there is no possibility of detaching that territory from Israel and creating a Palestinian state. So what we have today is actually apartheid. Hmm. Today we actually have on the ground one state between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. In other words, if you take the entire country, including the occupied territories, Israel together, they're all controlled by Israel today. It's all controlled by the Israeli army. There's only one legal system. There's only one governmental system. There's only one highway system, one currency. In other words, by any measure, there already is one country, but it's an apartheid country because close to half the population of the country, which is Palestinian, does not have citizenship, the Palestinians of the occupied territory. And so, uh, you know, and that's permanent. They'll never have citizenship because Israel insists that this is a Jewish country. So, uh, you know, you have a new apartheid regime in the world that we're saying is not legitimate, but it can't be negotiated away. That's the point. If it was just a conflict, you could negotiate a conflict. You know, a lot of hard conflicts have been negotiated. But when it's a colonial situation, 
I mean, what are the Palestinians supposed to do? They've given up 78% of their land. They've given up a lot of their national rights. But that doesn't satisfy the colonizers that want everything. So the only thing the Palestinians can do to satisfy Israel is to give in and basically say, okay, we're willing to live under an apartheid regime as oppressed, rightless people forever. And that, of course, they're not going to do. And so the only other way out, as I said, is decolonization. If Israel has created one state here that's an apartheid state, our job is to transform that apartheid state that Israel created into a democratic state of equal rights for all its citizens. It's interesting hearing you talk about uh, the PLO still advocating for a two-state solution, even though it's clearly materially uh, never going to emerge, can't emerge. So w- what's going on there? Well, there is no more PLO, really. I mean, the Palestinian Authority that took over control of the occupied territories under Oslo with Abu Mazen basically destroyed the PLO hmm. and has become just a, a collaborationist regime only dealing with the, with, the, with the occupied territory. It doesn't represent Palestinians in Gaza. It doesn't represent Palestinians inside Israel. It doesn't represent the refugees. And it doesn't represent Palestinians living abroad. So it just represents a little tiny fraction. And even mm-hmm. there, it doesn't really represent anybody because there haven't been elections for years. So why does this narrative, why, do, why, do the, why does the international community go along with this um, you know, charade effectively? Why is it still talked about? as though it's a a possibility? Well, I think uh, what the two-state solution does for Israel and especially for the international community is it creates the possibility of managing the conflict, you see, in a way because the international community does not want to expend the political capital needed to force Israel back to the the boundaries, even to the 78%. So that, for example, Britain, or the United States, or any all the countries of the world, basically, officially support the two-state idea. Hmm. I mean, officially, the, the UN has passed resolutions, and officially, you know, they want Israel to be on the 78%, and the Palestinians to get the 22%. But in order to force Israel back, because Israel won't leave its settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, especially voluntarily, it would have to expend a lot of political capital. We'll have to get into a fight with Israel. Hmm. Governments will have to get into a fight with the Jewish communities in their countries. And that brings up the whole issue of anti-Semitism. You could see how that was used against Jeremy Corbyn very effectively because he was critical of Israel. You know, as a matter of fact, the British government has officially adopted a position that says, an Israeli position that says criticism, any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism. You know, who wants to fight that? If you're a member of parliament, what, do you want to get in the fight with the Jewish community and be called an anti-Semite? Then you're going to get in the fight with the Christians. I mean, the Anglican Church is very pro-Israel. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, and not to mention the evangelicals in the U.S. and so on. And then you're going to fight the media. Because uh, the media tends to be uh, pro-Israel because you know, there's a subtext of race here. You know, the Israelis are us. They're white. They're European. You know, they speak English. Then you had the book Exodus, you know, with the heroes after the Holocaust and freedom and uh, the movie starring Paul Newman. <laughs> I mean, you can't get more American than this stuff. And... Uh, And they're us. And, of course, the Arabs are the other, and they're terrorists. You know, so Israel's managed to make that tie very strongly. And they're Muslims, and they're different. And Arafat didn't know English at all. You see, and so so the media kind of goes towards the Israelis because they can talk to the Israelis. They can understand the Israelis. And there's 101 other reasons. Mm -hmm. And that was the point of my book, War Against the People. Israel has actually parlayed its occupation in the what I call the technology of repression, yeah. military technologies and security and so on, as exports to other countries. So Israel's made itself very valuable to countries of the world. So it's worth supporting it as well. You see that now with the normalization with Morocco and Sudan and, and the UAE, all around military deals. So for all those reasons, Israel uh, is supported. Now, again, you know, in the sense of not not officially, officially everybody supports a two-state solution, 
But everybody closes their eyes, pretends there's a peace process. And again, it's all a part of conflict management that serves the governments in the sense that they can be seen as being as supporting a solution to this conflict, so-called, mm. while at the same time really letting Israel do whatever it wants to do. It's interesting, in the introduction to the book, you talk about a shift in opinion, I guess, about amongst some leading liberal Zionists in terms of accepting that the two-state solution is is dead, if it was ever, you know, plausible, um, and arguing instead in favour of a single democratic state. So I was wondering if there has been any broader shift in popular opinion amongst the Israeli Jewish population, like along the same lines. No. The Israeli, for the Israeli <laughs> Jewish population, with, you know, with a few exceptions, the one-state solution is a non-starter. I mean, Israel has to be a Jewish state. I mean, that's, I would say, 98% of, of Israeli Jews support that idea. So it's very much like South Africa. You know, in South Africa, the ANC knew that the whites in South Africa were not going to support the end of apartheid. I mean, they knew they were, Mandela wasn't going to run around the country trying to convince white people that apartheid was bad. It was not going to happen. <laughs> so they took that as a given. And then they went to the international civil society, you know, trade unions and churches and university groups and student groups and human rights and political groups and so on, hmm. and uh, mobilized them and built the anti-apartheid movement. Then in the end, isolated South Africa and made apartheid unsustainable. So when it collapsed, the whites had no choice except to go along with the transition. And I think that's what's going to happen here, is that the Israelis are not going to be partners in ending apartheid, Israeli apartheid and colonialism. They'll always resist that. And we have to create conditions in the world in which Israel's isolated, its settled colonial enterprise collapses, and then Israelis will be invited to join this new democratic state. We're very clear in our in our 10-point program, yep. the One Democratic State campaign, that it, this is an inclusive idea. It includes Israelis. It gives equal, not just individual rights, but equal collective rights to all the peoples living in this country. So it's not against Israelis, but it's simply saying that we cannot have an apartheid regime and this country has to belong to everyone. And so I think it's a very similar dynamic actually, to that of South Africa. Mm. We'll definitely talk about the, the One Democratic State campaign in just a moment. Um, one last thing, I guess, on uh, something that came up in the introduction in the book, again, there was a, a poll that you refer to, which um, in which it transpires that the Israeli Jews who were polled um, ranked the occupation and the, the conflict uh, with Palestinians seventh out of eight in a list of issues concerning them most. That seems to reflect a real remarkable level of disinterest. So why is it such a non-issue within the country? How is that even possible? Well, that's the, uh, that's the aspiration of a settler colonial project. And mm. that is, you know, you begin with violence, you begin with invasion, you begin with displacement, pushing people off the land, uh, asserting your own right to the land, conquering it, and so on. But at some point, you want to get to a point where you, you're beginning to normalize. The indigenous population is very weak. It's been defeated, maybe, certainly militarily. It has nowhere else to go. They sue for peace, which is, in a sense, what Arafat did when he accepted the two-state solution. And gradually, you know, the settler enterprise becomes normalized. Look at the United States. You know, except for the Native Americans, uh, most Americans don't see their country as, as settler colonial. It's become normal. Australia has become a, a normal country. And that's where settler colonialism wins. You see, if it if it, if it wins, and uh, and in a sense, Israel has gotten very far in terms of that for its own population. Certainly, in many ways, Israel, the government has managed by pacifying the Palestinians by keeping them militarily suppressed, by creating a real sense of personal security among Israelis so they're not afraid of terrorism anymore, to make the whole occupation disappear. Hmm. The Israelis don't go to the West Bank. They certainly don't go to Gaza. It's behind a wall. You never see Arabs. You don't care about Arabs. They're not an issue anymore. And we're living our normal lives. And so a settler colonial country tries very, very, very hard 
to impart a sense of normality to its people and to make uh, the oppression that it's based on disappear. And I think Israel has managed to, to do that. And that's one another reason why Israelis aren't going to participate in terms of liberating their country from colonialism, because it's good for them. They're benefiting from it. And they don't really see the problem. They're not, they're not suffering or threatened in any way. But at the same time, the Palestinians have managed to keep the issue alive. Mm. They're, they're not able to beat Israel, but at the same time, they are able to prevent Israel from winning and normalizing. Maybe not, maybe not locally. Israelis don't care what happens in the, in the West Bank. They don't think about it. But internationally in terms of governments, in terms of public opinion, in terms of the media, and so on, the Palestinian issue has been kept alive. So Israel has not succeeded in uh, in suppressing it abroad the way it succeeded in suppressing it at home. So what's been the Trump administration's legacy uh, the last four years? What's been the consequence in terms of that administration? And then what do you expect from the change in U.S. administrations now with the Biden White House, um, is it going to have a different approach to relations with Israel than Trump's regime? Just thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, they will. It'll be a change, but it won't be a change for the better. You know, the Trump really made a mess of things here in a sense. Mm. That is that, you know, you can't decolonize one country in a vacuum. You can't get to a decolonized, equal, just Palestine in a Middle East that's corrupt that's at war with each other, that's based on military stuff, that's oppressive to women and to others and so on, you know, uh, in which these regimes aren't elected, they don't represent anyone. And in a sense, that's what Trump has done. Trump's brand of politics comes from business. Hmm. It's called transactional politics. Deals. It's deals. So that from Trump's point of view, there's no politics, there's no human rights, there's no justice, there's no processes of reconciliation or development or anything like that. It's a deal. And all his deals are basically very short-term military deals. The United States is going to sell a billion dollars of arms to Morocco if Morocco recognizes Israel. And the, uh, the carrot in the whole process of persuasion is that Israel will recognize Morocco's occupation of the Western Sahara. Mm -hmm. yeah. you see, the UAE will make peace with Israel, and they'll get these F-35 stealth, uh, stealth fighter jets. You know, economic benefits for Bahrain, military benefits for all these. And it's not with the people. Mm. There's no real benefits for the people. These are benefits for the militaries and for the regimes to keep their people, you know, to keep themselves in, in office. You know, the UAE has like one and a quarter million people that are em Emiratis ruling over a population of eight or nine million foreign workers hmm. that are underpaid, half slave workers that'll never get citizenship there. They live there their whole lives. You know, well, what do they need arms for? They need arms to protect themselves from the 90% of the people living in the country that are oppressed. And, uh, you know, to fight all kinds of proxy wars for the United States, like against Iran. The whole calculation of Trump is completely with an American interest in mind. And, and then everybody falls into place because he makes the, the, the temptation so great. So it changes things, but not for, not for the best. It, it reinforces corruption. It reinforces militarism. It reinforces inequalities. And then that's given to Biden to deal with. You see, so Biden goes back to the traditional politics that does deal more with international relations. But Biden, like all other American presidents, you know, is very pro-Israel. You know, you go back in a sense to American politics, and that is that the pro-Israel forces who are the Jewish community, the evangelicals and the Republican Party, uh, the media, are all have all been pro-Israel all these years. There's no, you know, there's a there is a fairly large Arab community in the U.S. Matter of fact, there's as many Arabs in the U.S. as there are uh, Jews, but they're you know they're newcomers. 
there's a lot of racism against Arabs, against Islam, against people of color. They certainly don't have the leverage that the Jewish community has. And so in a sense, uh, Biden, it's not going to be as cynical and transactional as it was under Trump, but it's certainly going to be no less pro-Israel, I think, under Biden than it was under Trump. So let's talk a little bit now about, I guess, your own work. So you were involved with the Israeli Committee Against Housing Demolitions, and now there's this new campaign, the One Democratic State campaign, founded uh, a couple of years ago in 2018. Yeah, so could you say a little bit more about your work broadly, but I guess with a specific focus on the One Democratic State campaign? You know, the organization I've been with for, since we started in 1997, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, or ICAD as we call ourselves, um, was always a political organization. In other words, we focused on the issue of house demolitions. Israel's demolished about 60,000 Palestinian homes in the occupied territory since 1967, in addition to tens of thousands more within Israel and, of course, coming out of the Nakba in 1948. So house demolitions is a key part of this ethnic cleansing process we talked about, displacing the Palestinians. But uh, the issue for us wasn't demolitions per se, of course. It was to use the house demolition issue as a vehicle for political change, to explain to people how the occupation works, what Israel's intentions are, to give people really a window into the occupation in order to mobilize people through the house demolition issue around the Palestinian issue, to educate them about the Palestinian issue through house demolitions, as, even as we opposed house demolitions. We were always political. But then, of course, as the two-state solution, this is in 97, this is during Oslo, as the two-state solution receded, and, and of course, again, we finally understood that it never, it never really was at any rate, we were kind of left floundering a little bit because we didn't want to just be a resistance movement or a protest movement or a human rights movement. We wanted to change things. We, want, we, we were political. Uh, and so in 2017, 2018, we managed to link up forces with Palestinians, mainly Palestinian citizens of Israel. We call 48 Palestinians who themselves were going through an evolution. 48 Palestinians have been living in Israel, and their major issue was equal rights within Israel. They would like to have Israel as a, as a country of all its citizens and not a Jewish country, but at least to get their basic civil rights, which they don't have. And I think as the Israeli government under Netanyahu has gotten more and more and more right wing and uh, xenophobic and racist, especially with the passing last year of the Jewish Nationalities Law. Mm. that really It was really an apartheid law that made it very clear that, that there's two levels of citizenship and rights here. I think that many Palestinians in Israel, not most of them, but a, a number of them, began to understand that they couldn't solve their problems in Israel separate from the issue of the Palestinians in the occupied territory. Mm. They couldn't just ignore the occupation and only focus on their own issue because they weren't going to get anywhere either. And so they have actually two agendas. One is to have a more comprehensive thing of, again, decolonizing the entire country. So trying very much to bring the occupation and what's happening in Israel together, but also, of course, to bring the refugees into the picture because the refugees have never have always been excluded from negotiations. So... And at the same time, then, to unify the Palestinians. Because as the PLO has been dismantled and destroyed by the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinians have lost that larger political voice that represented all Palestinians. And so they have that, a sort of a double agenda. But with that change, then, they began to understand that the one-state solution was really an imperative, a, a, a key part of the equation. And so we came, we began to come together, Israeli Jews like me that are anti-colonial and Palestinians. And then the Palestinians, the 48 Palestinians started to reach out to others so that our movement has gotten, gotten wider. 
and we began to meet. And the real accomplishment so far that we've done is we've formulated over a couple of years of discussions a 10-point political program mm, yeah, based on the idea of decolonizing from settler colonialism, a one-state idea. So in other words, what we've managed to do, which is really an accomplishment given the estrangement in a way of Palestinians and Israelis, is we've thought through the entire process of decolonization from dismantling all the structures of control and domination of the Zionist Israeli colonial uh, regime all the way through, what does that mean? What is our vision of the new society, the new polity after colonization, after liberation? So we've thought through the whole process and we have a very uh, good program and I think we've developed a strategy around it, which is very clear with a very clear analysis and very compelling in my view And on the basis of that, now we're trying to reach out also to Israelis, but mainly to Palestinians around the world and eventually to civil society around the world uh, and really try to mobilize like the ANC did Hmm. for an effective anti-apartheid, anti-colonial liberation campaign based on the global grassroots. So, uh, you know, we have a long ways to go. Yeah. And there are a lot of Palestinians that still remain. It's not that they're not convinced. Almost every Palestinian knows the one-state solution is okay. I mean, that was the original mm-hmm. position of the PLO when it began, was one state. But I think a lot of them are exhausted, especially in the occupied territory. They're disenfranchised by the PA. Uh, they're living under this Israeli occupation. They're just suffering. They're trying to survive. And a lot of Palestinians say they don't really have the mental space to entertain a whole new campaign for one state, starting all over again. Mm. So our job is to try to convince a, a critical mass that this is not utopian, that this is really a doable thing if we organize around a concrete political program, because the two state solution doesn't exist anymore. And if you don't have a political program, then you're just floundering. You have no leverage at all. You know, what do you want? So you've got to have a political program and then to organize around that. Mm. So just to, to jump in then, I guess, on one element of the program that's in the 10-point the program, and this is coming from a place of ignorance on my part, but I found the scale of the Palestinian refugee population astounding, uh, which, which you detail in the book. So, you know, more than 7 million people displaced, whether that's in refugee camps, internally displaced, or in other countries. And that actually less than half the Palestinian population remains in the country. So the right to return, therefore, is going to be a vital component to any sort of lasting democratic project. But even though, by the way, even those that remain in the country... Many of them are displaced. We call them the internally displaced yeah. population. So so the 7 million are Palestinians living abroad, but even most of the Palestinians living inside the country still are not living in, you know, where they were. There's still refugee camps. And I mean, Gaza, for example, is uh, mainly Palestinians that used to live within the 48 borders. Mm. So what needs to happen then, like physically, psychically, to allow the kind of right to return uh, for the Palestinian refugees? Well, I mean, that's, I think, the the, uh, real achievement of of ours is we've not only thought it through, but we've really come up with some good practical answers. And, you know, Mm. our idea isn't just to come up with some declaration. You know, if you're going to be in the political arena, you've got to really be concrete. You have to show people how this is going to work. Mm. Now, with the refugees, for example... There's a uh, a Palestinian geographer whose name is Salman Abu Sita, who's done a lot of work on um, refugees and land issues. And he's discovered that 85% of the land that was taken from the Palestinians in 1948, it was called the Nakba in 1948, is still available. In other words, it's, it's land that the Israelis never built on. Hmm. It's either agricultural land or it's national parks. You know, Israelis planted uh, forests and parks on top of a a lot of these villages and so on. So the villages have been destroyed. More than 530 entire villages, urban neighborhoods, towns were destroyed 
1948 and afterwards. But the lands are still there. So the idea that Palestinians who want to return can actually physically return. Now, they're not going to return to their homes. The homes are gone. Yeah. But they can return to the part of the country where they're from and revive their life in the country. Now, there's an organization, an Israeli organization, uh, called the Zohrot, which means remembering. Uh, and it's uh, Israeli, Palestinians, and, uh, and Jews that work, that work on that. The idea is to remember the Nakba and to prepare for the return of the refugees. So what Zohrot has done is they've gotten a whole generation of young Palestinian urban planners together, and they've developed plans for new cities that would be built for the refugees when they come back. I mean, they wouldn't be only refugees. You don't want to isolate them either. Mm. They, would, they would be integrated communities, but they would have modern infrastructure. In other words, the idea isn't to bring a 48 Palestinian and stick him or her in some old house somewhere The point isn't only return, because the Palestinian refugees are traumatized, they're undereducated, they're underemployed, they're poor, they're a population that really has tremendous daunting road road before them in terms of re-entering society. So you've got to bring them back, uh, you know, to a modern uh, community with infrastructure, with employment, with education, and so on. in interaction with others so that they can re-enter society. So in other words, for all our ideas politically, all our points, we really have some very hard-headed, concrete ideas about how this could actually be done. So we're very much concerned that our program not only be politically just, but that be practical and doable so that it's, it's an actual alternative that people can adopt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to change tack a little bit, I guess, in, in the work that you're doing now, um, and you refer to yourself in the book as a, a colonist who refuses, and the phrase comes up a few times. So, um, yeah, in the context of discussing your positionality. So could you say a bit more about this, why it's important to reflect on when you're undertaking solidarity work? Well, it's very difficult um, solidarity work when, when you're coming from the, the colonizer population. I was in a webinar last night, and uh, I was saying, talking like I was today, we have to do this, we have to do this, and we have a program. And one of the Palestinians said, hey, who's we? Mm. (laughs) And it's true. You see, you know, and I'm always aware of that, of course, that there is colonization, that I'm one of the, I'm a colonizer. I mean, I came from the United States. I wasn't born here. So uh, in our terms, I mean, I wasn't aware of it then necessarily, but I didn't immigrate to Israel. I uh, colonized. I was part of the the colonizing population. And certainly I'm not a Palestinian, and I can't speak for Palestinians. So we're very careful, I think, me and the other Israeli Jews that are involved with this movement, of our positionality and of the fact that The one democratic state campaign, like any campaign of liberation, has to be led by Palestinians. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the indigenous people. They're the oppressed. They're the ones who are colonized. And one of the major, the key elements of decolonization isn't just, you know, ending colonization and dismantling structures of domination. It's really recognizing and accepting the sovereignty of the indigenous population, Mm. meaning that they have a right to say, this is where we want to go. These are the conditions. This is what we need in order to, you know, resolve this this colonial situation. And as a matter of fact, in in a way, they have the majority say, because Mm. uh, we've already set the contours of the country. They're going to have to live even... If Palestine is liberated, they're going to have to live like other colonized people within a new post-colonial reality that still is very much shaped by the colonial experience, economically, in terms of the landscape, in terms of the population, ideologically, and so on. And so they really have to have even more of a say in terms of trying to rectify things so they can exert their influence and at least bring the country back to some degree 
to something that they recognize and they feel comfortable in. Uh, and um, in that whole process of empowering the indigenous population, it's very important that people like me, who are powerful, who are colonists, uh, who don't speak for the indigenous, know our place. In a sense, uh, concede to the Palestinians that political space and cultural space that they need in order to, to exert their sovereignty. That was Jeff Halper, author of Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine. If you're enjoying this discussion and want to keep listening, then head over to patreon.com forward slash Pluto Press, where members can enjoy the unabridged version of this and previous episodes of Radicals in Conversation. Finally, a reminder that podcast listeners can order the new book with an exclusive 50% discount. Just head over to plutobooks.com forward slash podcast reading and use the coupon podcast at the checkout. We'll be back next month with another episode of Radicals in Conversation. So until then, we hope you have a safe and relaxing holiday and a happy new year. Goodbye. <laughs>